Hello out there. We're on the air. It's, it's Rink Moose, Moose Talk tonight. The beers are cold. The mics light up. And, and the, the boys, boys get, get set to fight. The gloves come off. Opinions get thrown. And someone slips on ice. One man howls. The other scowls. But the show must go on. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game. You're an announcer with a long stick from time to time. With hockey flows. And more shots known. Pierre McGuire's life. Not John's a leap. Ovechkin's team. And Hoffman's crazy wife. When Carey slumps. And Bergevin stumps. Drez on LaFontaine. Jokes aside, it's podcast time. And Rink Moose is the name. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. Hello, everybody. And welcome to episode 16 Ooh. of the Rink Moose Hockey Podcast, a weekly episodic podcast where two good friends get together and discuss all things NHL as well as their implications in fantasy hockey. I'm one of your hosts, Nick Costu, along with my good pal, Leroy Jenkins himself. Oh. Yes. Kyle, nice. Hi, Nick. How's it going? Pretty good. Pretty so, good. Um, I'll start with a quick story. On uh, I, And I, this is a story I told you when we went to Shinny Hockey on last Saturday. Fantasy hockey has been an absolute nightmare for me in the past couple of weeks. I came this close to quitting the NHL for good. That means no podcast. No fantasy hockey, deleting all my apps, everything. I feel just betrayed by the sport, and it's, and it's sad. It's very sad. But no, Wait, I'm, well, I'm just well, I'm dicking around. I'm, I'm dicking around. I'm dicking around. But mostly, oh. I was just pissed, man. Like I was, I would check the score every day, and I would just be like, "Wow, I can't believe this is happening," as well as all the other stuff. Like, it was just one of those weeks, you know, where everything's going against you. I had none of my goalies let in under the, under five goals. I had Horvat had a fucking career night on my bench. I was like, oh, Horvat versus, you know, I think it was Nashville or Tampa Bay. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to play him. I got a full bench. I got a full roster. So I was like, oh, sit him. Four points. Unbelievable. I dropped Duchesne. He went off. And then, uh, yeah, just my opponent was just firing on all cylinders. He was having a crazy, crazy week. So, yeah, I'm just uh, just getting back into the swing of things here. And it, uh, it's not going so bad anymore. Well, actually, I'm, I'm looking at your matchup this week. It doesn't look too good. No, it'll be fine. Okay. Don't you worry. But, th- again, like, look at my, the, what my opponent's doing this week as well is off the charts. Like it's this is how unlucky I'm getting. This guy right now would be leading anybody in our league. And I've had oh, that yeah. twice in a in a row. Braden would have beat anybody last week. This guy fucking Bradshaw, you who would be he would beat anybody this week so far as well. So it's like I'm in a rut, but uh I feel like I feel like I'll get out of it once I get through this week. Yeah, fair. You just need some luck. Oh. <sighs> I need some luck. I need I need Montreal. I need Price to get a shout out tonight. Could you imagine? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting how he's he's losing starts now, but hopefully the time off helps. Well, we'll we'll get into him a little bit later in our uh, surprise player segment, I'm sure. But uh, we want to move on to our first topic of the day. It's uh, it's one we've all covered quite a lot, but uh, it's taken some some weird twists now. It's getting down to crunch time for the Nylander situation, Nick. Uh, we've got about two weeks left until the ball drops. We're finally going to get a decision. And uh, as the way I see it, there's about three ways this could go. He could sign a contract, he could get traded, or he can sit the season. And uh, if he sits the season, I believe he plays in the KHL or Swedish League, something like that. But uh, definitely not in the NHL after December 1st. So what is my take on this with two weeks left? In my opinion, you cannot have this guy sit a year in such a year where we have a chance to win the cup as as Toronto. So that to me, that's almost worst case scenario. Second worst is you cannot act 
too hastily in which you make a trade in which you obviously lose. Because that, uh, that doesn't help the team either, and that's more of a long-term thing. Uh, so right now, best case scenario, A, we sign him for a, a, a decent deal. Or B, we make a trade that is fair. And I think Dubas is working all his options right now because from what I can see, the talks are going to go right down to the wire. And I'm sure he's working the phones just saying, hey, what can you give me? What do you have on the table? But at the same time, it's it's kind of a funny scenario because he cannot seem desperate in any way. If Dubas makes it look like he's under pressure at all, then other NHL GMs are going to jump all over him. So I, I feel for the guy. It must be a very hard scenario. But uh, I, I think there are offers on the table. I'm not sure exactly what they are. We've heard some names here and there. There's been whispers, but uh, nothing concrete. So um, what I thought we could do, Nick, is, uh, well, you just give me your quick take on the whole situation so far, and then maybe we can talk about some potential trade moves that we think uh, might be A, good, or B, bad. Well, I saw the news this past weekend. I think that's when it broke saying that the Leafs were listening on, on offers for Nylander. And, and I wasn't too surprised because I'm hearing reports of, of him asking for $8 million, Yeah, which is just, uh, it, it's a fiasco in my opinion. I mean, you look at the comparisons, you see what guys like Pasternak are making, you see what guys like Nikolai Ehlers are making, mm-hmm. and... Uh, uh, eight eight million. When you look at those contracts, it just doesn't doesn't look feasible. Um, it it looks like if the Leafs were to do that, they'd be in salary cap turmoil for the next, you know, coming years. Mm-hmm. So to me, I think if he's going to stay on this path of asking for eight mil or in the high sevens, or even in the sevens for that matter, I I don't think you can take him up on it. And I think you're going to have to trade him. And and that's why I want to have this discussion with you right now, which is what would you consider to be a fair return for this young talent mm-hmm. in Willie Nylander? Uh, so there's a couple assumptions that we have to make. I, is it fair to say that the Toronto Maple Leafs will be looking for a top two solid defenseman for a return in the deal? Uh, top two might be a stretch. I, I think be. even like a solid three, four, as long as he's a young and B there's control in that contract. I think yeah. those things are, are even more important than whether you want to classify him as a one or a two or whatever. What I've noticed on the Twitter sphere, the NHL Twitter sphere is that Leafs fans alike, Leafs fans across all aspects, are they seem to value Nylander a lot higher than I would personally. Like the, I'm seeing deals on the table that seem really fair to me and people on, you know, social media and, you know, Steve Dangle and all those guys are going, no way, not a chance. I would never do that. So yeah, it just seems like the, the fan base here, they really love this guy and they're, they might be expecting a little much for this return. Yeah, no, and you look at the point totals. I mean, he's just over 60 points the last two years. That's nothing to, you know, dance about. No. I mean, like, that. that's... We have guys in the league putting up 70, 80, 90, and this guy still hasn't gotten to that range. He He's taken a back seat to Matthews and Martin, regardless what he does, in, like, and the hierarchy of young forwards on this team. Oh, yes, yes. So, to me you got to be realistic about what your return is. And, and as I said, I, I think age is important. I, I don't want it to be like a Subban Weber deal where you're, mm-hmm. you're trading a, a younger guy, a healthier guy in Subban, like Nylander in this case, mm-hmm. for an older stay-at-home guy who's just going to help you for the next two or three years. Yeah, I, I want young talent that's going to help this team for this long-term trajectory that we see the Leafs having where they're competing for the cup each and every year. Yeah, and I've I've just recently heard that he has been offered the Pasternak deal, like the exact same deal, and uh, Pasternak's leading the league in goals by four. He's got seventeen. So <laughs> I just can't uh, I can't imagine the Nylander camp going, yeah, 
Pastor Next deal's not bad, but we're at, we're gonna, we're thinking of getting more. It's like, what the fuck? How can you say that? And Pastor Next deal was signed last year, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, not too long ago. So it's not like it's it's gone out of control with the cap going up and the percentage is getting all out of whack. Like for them to offer the Pasternak deal this year is basically saying you're you're Pasternak but just a little less, which is fucking fair enough, man. Like he's asking for top thirty player money and he's never put up anywhere close. Anyways, yeah, we we've we've barked up that tree, but uh, I wanted I want to throw some names at you, Nick, that uh, that have come up in conversations. Uh, just on social media and on on radio shows and that kind of thing. And I want to I want to get your opinion on uh, whether you think this would be fair deals. Okay, Nick. So for the first one here, uh, a name that I've seen come up from the St. Louis Blues. So this will hit home for you is Colton Pareko, a one for one. William Nylander for Colton Pareko. Who wins and who loses in that deal? And do they and who disagrees on the deal? Well, I really like the player. I know he's had his rough patches this season, uh, highlighting the Montreal game specifically, where he, he gave up the, the game-winning goal there. But, man, this is a big guy. This is a good puck transporter, a good skater for his size. He's got a lot of great pieces. Uh, I'm not too familiar with his contract, so I, I can't really get into that. But... I mean, the, the player is great, and he's got size, which I think is something that's missing on their defense. It's mobile, and they move the puck. But it's not, you know, it, it's not tough. It's not big. It doesn't have that much size and grit. So I think this guy would add in that respect. And I'm looking at his contract, $5.5 yeah. until 2021-2022, which... I don't know. For that guy, seems fair, especially when you can, you know, compare it to guys like Zeit and and Gardner, what they're making. So I, I I'd give the thumbs up to this one. Yeah, from a Leafs perspective, perspective, Nick, I am totally fine with this deal. Pareko, he seems like that solid, solid guy. He's got a he's got a rocket shot, but most importantly, he's a guy that can uh, can control a game physically. And if things start getting out of hand in the playoffs, he can he can step up for your team. And he's that calming presence on the back end. They've got a lot of silky puck movers back there. And I think this guy would uh, would really balance things out. And the, the contract number, I don't have a problem with that either. So this is a this is one from a least per- perspective. I'm agreeing with you. I, I'd give the go-ahead for this. Um, now, another one, I've heard this one actually quite a bit out there. And this one is very intriguing indeed. It's uh, Matthew Dumba from the Minnesota Wild. Uh, just personally, I don't know if I'm Minnesota. I don't know if I make that deal. I have heard it, but uh, yeah, I think Minnesota, Min- or Toronto would win this hands down. What do you think? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I love the deal from Toronto's perspective. I'm I'm a big fan of Minnesota in general, what they've been doing so far this year. We'll get more into that next week when we talk about our surprise and disappointing teams. But, uh, man, th- this guy, he's great. Again, he brings grit, but he's also a puck mover. He's mm-hmm. got a great shot. He can be a presence on the power play and the penalty kill. I'd, I'd be a huge fan of getting this player from the lead. Uh, to your point about what Minnesota should do, uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I think it's a fair deal because you look at their forwards, and, and there's a lot of age there. Zach Parise. Mika Koivu. <laughs> Stall. Um, I mean, it, it's it, it's getting old. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a, a young stud forward on their team would be Charlie Coyle, who I who I don't think is is, is a stud. So, to me, it's, it seems like they, they'd welcome Nylander with open arms. Right. So, there could very well be uh, some merit. But what I heard and this was Bobby Mack speaking, is uh, they're kind of reluctant to part with any of their D. And so, like, they've been doing so well in pressing goals against that they almost are reluctant to to make that. And they're scoring enough. I mean, you look at the standings and they're doing great. So, to me, it's like, why why fix what's not broken, you know? 
Yeah, this one, this one, Minnesota seems a bit more out there than the rest. Um, this next team, I think, would be a, a really good fit because they are a team that has struggled to score and they do have an abundance of, uh, of good young talent on the back end. It's Carolina. So hmm. there's several different players here that, that could be coming back our way if, it's, um, if, it's, if the deal's made. Uh, one of them is Dougie Hamilton, and I know he just got there, but he fits that mold as a uh, as a a guy who's young, controllable, um, RFA, uh, really really good player, solid defensively, can get uh, get put up some points as well. My feeling is that Carolina would be very reluctant to part with a Dougie Hamilton, especially because uh, he just got there. But you know he hasn't had the best season yet offensively there. Um, so another name I've heard is, uh, Brett Pesci, who honest to God, I don't know a lot about Nick, but, uh, this definitely wouldn't be a one for one. There'd be other pieces involved. Um, but just to that point, we need to make a point about saying the Leafs need a guy who's good this year and good next year. They don't need a guy who's, you know, playing in the OHL this year because, like we said, their window is right now and then in the next, the next couple of years, especially while they have Matthews and Marner under those uh, rookie contracts. So um, Pesci would be a guy who doesn't make sense to me, uh, even if there was a, uh, a a deal in there. What do you think of Carolina as a, as a suitor? Well, I agree with the abundance on defense, as well as the fact they'd welcome scoring, much like, uh, you know, Minnesota would. With open arms. Uh, what I heard was Jacob Slavin was more yeah. of a favorite that the Leafs were looking for. But Pesci, you don't know too much about him, like you said. He's he's a bigger defenseman. He brings size, which we mentioned with Pareko. Uh, he's more a 3 4 on that team, not a 1 2. Uh, so, hence why I'd understand why the deal would maybe involve something else coming from Carolina. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good deal, but it's by no means the best deal. Like I, I feel like the Leafs would take that and be like, hmm, we could have got something else from another team who's got an even better talent. So that's that's my take on that one. Yeah. Um Yeah, fair enough. I, I'm not I don't love any of those Carolina D, to be honest. And I know we're not getting Hamilton. No. So I, I don't love the return from there, in, in my opinion. Now, do you do you have another team on your list there? I do. I okay, one, get to I that. Actually, two more teams and then one that I really, okay. really like. So just quickly, uh, Philadelphia is another team with an abundance of good young talent on defense. Uh, people were throwing the name Goss to spare out, but uh, that's something... Mm. A, I don't think the Leafs really need. Again, he's I don't think more that's that, a fit, yeah. He's, yeah, he's that offensive guy. Um, he's like a, you know, he's like a Riley, but, uh, you know, not as probably not as good defensively, to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. so another name there would be a Travis Sanheim who more fits the mold of, uh, of like a Pareko kind of guy. Maybe a Pareko light is, is a Sanheim and he's still young. So he's got a lot of proving to do, but he's, he's one of those guys who's solid up and coming and, uh, steady defensively. Uh, we're not even going to mention Provorov cause they would never do that. So uh, mm -hmm. if it were this deal, it would be Sandheim Plus, uh, which uh, I I don't think I'd make that deal either. Uh, it's just been thrown out there. It depends what the plus is. It would have to be a big plus because, I mean, Sandheim, sure, he's he's got a little bit of promise, but I don't think he can turn into that uh, solid, can't-miss top 4D guy. Yeah, I agree. I mean, to me, it comes with the it, it comes down to the proven thing, and and guys like Dumba, Pareko, they've been around for a couple of years at least. They've been in long playoff runs. They've been in tough series versus the Blackhawks and played in Game Sevens against them. I mean, that's the stuff I look for. I I want a proven sample size and this commodity I'm getting in return for for Willie. And to me, Sandheim just doesn't fit the bill there. You're, you're playing with fire there, trading for a guy who hasn't really made his stamp in the NHL. Yeah. So I would really wave the red flag on that one. So this next one comes from a team, and that honestly makes a lot of sense to me. 
um, it, just because of what their needs are and what Toronto's needs are. So uh, the name Jake Muzzin has been thrown out there. Uh, mm. A guy similar to Pareko, he's been very solid. He's got a great shot from the point. And LA, a team that wants to get, we know that, faster. They just acquired Carl Hagelin, which we'll get into. Uh, so LA is a team that is dying to add some youthful exuberance and, and offense. And Toronto wants, uh, wants a guy like Muzzin in return. Now, in this case, also, I don't think it would be just Muzzin. I think it would be Muzzin and, and a little bit more. But uh, just personally, I, I like Muzzin a lot for the, the role he would get in Toronto. Again, that just solid, um, solid big defenseman who can skate and can shoot. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think this would be a viable deal, in my opinion, and I, I could see that uh, working out for both teams. Yeah, no, I love this player. Next to Drew Doughty, this is their best defenseman. Yeah, to me, I mean, I, I just don't see why L.A. would part with the it's funny that you mentioned that, you know, it would be Muzzin plus coming from LA, but if they were to get rid of him, they'd have a gaping hole on that second unit. I mean, the, the, the staple of this defense is obviously Dowdy. And then Muzzin is kind of a stabilizer on the second defensive pairing there. So I, I think if they traded him, there'd be a big void there left on that blue line. So I, I think if they did trade a defensive, it, it would be more of like an Alec Martinez type. But uh, I, I, I don't see Muzzin move anywhere. Would, would I take him if I'm the Leafs? Heck yeah. I just don't see this this deal being that appealing to L.A. But I, I could be wrong because we've seen in these last few games, especially that Leafs game, how they just look god-awful and they need to change things quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do, would, would you do uh, Nylander for Muzzin one for one as, a, as an L.A. guy? If I'm the Kings, uh, it's tough because I really love the player. <laughs> but I'm looking at this team and how they're playing, and it's just piss poor. Oh, it's boy. slow. And they need – you're right. You mentioned it. Youthful exuberance. And, and Willie is the definition of that. So I might have to take that deal. Mm, interesting. So the next one here, Nick, is one that I haven't heard anyone talk about, but it's something that I personally think would make uh, make a lot of sense and what I would really enjoy. Uh, mostly as a Leafs fan, but what do you, what do you think of this? I'm just gonna th- this is just having fun here. Um, William Nylander for Aaron Ekblad in Florida. Now let me get oh, hold on hold on let me get into it. So Ekblad again, he fits the bill as something as one of those guys they're looking for. He's a big solid guy good defensively he has been pretty darn poor offensively so far this season I think he's got like one goal two assists three points and Mm -hmm. the fact that Florida has Yandel firing on all cylinders and Mike Matheson who's promising as hell uh, I I think it would make sense for both teams I don't don't see why this would be so far-fetched I mean Nylander's a big big name and Ekblad has shown that he hasn't lived up quite to the draft pedigree of a first overall, but at the same time, he's a young player, a lot of potential there, and I think uh, I think it would be great fit in Toronto. I mean, I, I I'm sorry, Kyle, I don't see this one. On which because side? to me, we've talked about all those teams: L.A., Minnesota. They're struggling to score. They badly need these forwards up front, and to me, Florida. They already addressed that in the off season with acquiring Mike Hoff. Mm. So between your centers in Trocek and Barkov, and then your wingers in plethora of wingers, Dadanov has emerged this year into a star. You have Hoffman, and it, it's just you have Bukestad, you have Huberto. Their top six looks pretty solidified, and I don't think they're they're really that desperate. For a, for a Willie Nylander. And if they did get rid of Ekblad, you just have Matheson and Yandel on the back end, which to me is not enough. I mean, who's your three? Who's your four? Who's your five? Who's your six? So to me, I don't see this deal being that palatable for the uh, for the Florida Panthers. Fair enough, fair enough. I would just, now, uh... what I will say, if that's all the teams you got there, it is, is... What about the Anaheim Ducks? Montour. 
I think this is the best fit. This is actually, where I uh, would predict he's going. I, I actually had that down and I skipped it, to be honest. Because I, I look at this team, they, they're having trouble scoring. They have a lot of aging forwards, Kessler, Getzlav, Perry. Your, your, your only real young studs are Casse and uh, Raquel. Other than that, there's a void there. And you saw them get shut out for Nashville last night yet again. Um, it, it's not looking too bright there from an offensive standpoint. Mm. And and John Gibson's having to bail them out each and every night. Johnny. Whereas on the back end, you've got you know a uh, Brandon Montour, who's a stud. I I could not see them parting with him. But even like a Josh Manson, I'd happily accept if I'm the Leafs. No, because he's got one, grit. Though. He's got size. He's a puck moving defenseman. I would take that deal one for one. No way. Yep. I would take Josh Manson for Nylander one for one. Wow. He's very good, Kyle. I know you don't watch a lot of games out west. I don't. He's very good. Wow. I don't I don't see them getting on tour. Like that that to me, Anaheim would not accept. But a Josh Manson, I I'd I'd like that deal quite a bit. Wow. See that the funny thing, and this is what I mentioned before, that is if you posted that to Twitter right now, the Leafs fans would eat you up. They'd be like, I'm not taking Montour. I'm not taking I wouldn't even take both of those guys Because they don't know they don't know these teams. Give me Montour. To me, those are just uneducated fans who don't know much about the West Coast and and the hockey out there. Yeah. Yeah. Even though these are fantastic talents. I mean, you watch an Anaheim game, Montour is all over the place. He is that defenseman who's just skating up and down the ice and just making these amazing plays each and every night. I would love that player. If I was the Leafs, I'd give up Nealon plus a tidbit, oh. and maybe I'd have a chance at him. Oh, my God. But I just, to me, he seems untouchable from an Anaheim perspective. Dubas might get run out of town if that happened. If, if they gave up a little bit more... Nylander plus, oof. Oh, like a trouble. little prospect, like a B prospect. Eh, I guess, I guess, but I'm just saying, people online are gonna fuck you up. Yeah, they are not happy Whatever. about this at all. But uh, yeah, as I said before, I don't want him sitting. I do not want him sitting the year. You know how bad that's gonna feel, Nick. That'll <laughs> feel awful. If if we get knocked out in the first round somehow and it's close, like game seven, to like one or two goal difference, ooh, there's gonna be trouble. There's gonna be big trouble. But anyways, we uh we did our Nylander part. Now let's go to some breaking news, or not breaking news, but some big news from the week. There's a trade between Pittsburgh and LA. It happens to be one of my favorite teams and one of your favorite teams. Mm-hmm. So Carl Hagelin goes to L.A. Tanner Pearson goes to Pittsburgh. Quick note on both of those guys. They've both been pretty darn bad this year. Hagelin, uh, although does give L.A. some much-needed speed that they they desperately covet right now. Um, He's a guy who's known for being speedy and, you know, not a whole lot else. Uh, In terms of their cap hits, they are actually exactly identical because... I think Haglin was a four million cap hit, and Pittsburgh retained two hundred fifty thousand just so they could be identical cap hits. Um, so to me, in terms of uh, what kind of message this sends, it, it it's more to me the GM making a move, somewhat lateral, somewhat for need, and just saying, guys, if if you guys don't wake up right now, there's the, the moves are going to keep on happening. This is a big shakeup of the locker room saying, you know, we have to be better. Um, now, in terms of other contractual information, Haglin is on an expiring deal. His deal is done at the end of this year. Pearson is actually signed through 2021. So Pearson's a lot more controllable here. Um, now, Haglin has never been a real point producer in his career. He's never actually put up more than 40 points. So Pearson has uh, two seasons removed from a 24-goal season. So that's pretty That's pretty darn good. I, I'm not going to lie to you, Nick. When I first saw the deal, I was very upset because I've seen what Haglin can do in the playoffs. He's one of those guys who, who can step up in a big way in, in a series. But uh, you know what? He just hasn't shown up this year. And I don't think Pearson's an all that bad of a return either. So 
Um, we're, they're going to miss Hagelin in the playoffs. I, I can guarantee there's going to be something missing speed-wise for Pittsburgh in the playoffs there. But uh, I, I don't think Pearson's that bad, and I think Pearson has a chance if he plays with a Crosby or a Malkin to really show something that we haven't seen yet in L.A. So, honestly, it's a good deal for both teams, in my opinion. It, it gives Pittsburgh the shakeup they want, and it gives L.A. the speed they're looking for. What, what do you think? Well, we'll start from Pittsburgh. To me, there seems to be this void that's still there about who can play with Sid, a consistent <laughs> partner with Sid. It has never, ever changed, has it? <laughs> it yeah, and, and they thought it was going to be Daniel Sprong, and I believe he was called down recently. He's in the doghouse. <laughs> and, and Connor Sheary, yeah, he, he should have been in our segment last week. Yeah. And, and, and Connor Sheary, they lost him to Buffalo. Yeah. So they're looking for something because because it looks pretty, you know, Malkin and, and Kessel, they've got some good chemistry, but Crosby just doesn't have a dancing partner right now. Yeah. So maybe this Tanner Pearson will fit. I'll be honest, I never liked the player. But boring, with that said, eh? he seemed to be a guy who strives when he plays with a talented center. Like he's not a great player in in in, in himself. Yeah. But when placed with a Jeff Carter and a Tyler Toffoli, that line, that seventies line, was fantastic because mm. you had the shooting and the speed of Toffoli, but you had the net front presence and and just the guy who gets the dirty goals and Pearson, and then the guy who just uh, fil- facilitated it all in in Carter. So maybe Pittsburgh can can get something going there, and and they can find some kind of chemistry. So that's what I think of it from the Pittsburgh side. And then from L.A., I mean, you get rid of him, which was great, because he only had something like three points all season. Yeah, pitiful. I mean, you mentioned his career high in goals. Yeah, it was 24 goals. But it was still only like a 44-point season. Yeah. And that's his best season ever in the NHL. So that's nothing to ride home about. So to me, if you're L.A., you get this speedster in Haglin, something you really need. He's familiar with the West Coast and the Western Conference because he he started his career in Anaheim. Mm-hmm. So he I think he'll settle in just fine. I don't expect him to put up like 25 goals, but at the very least, he'll provide you with some speed on the wings, which they badly need. Mm-hmm. Where he slots in, first line, second line, third line, I have no idea. And and he's by no means, you know, the, the missing puzzle piece that's going to solve this fucking awful hideous problem in LA yeah but he's something and he's something they need so we'll see what happens here one thing I I will say to you that to give you a little glimmer of more hope there Nick is the HBK line a couple of years ago was one of the most deadly lines in hockey Haglin oh, Benino yeah. and Kessel those guys I think it was in the 2016 run were absolutely lights out as a line so, yeah, again, the potential is there for Haglin to uh, to be a very effective player in the playoffs. So that that's good. But I just don't think L.A. is going to make it there this year. So I don't know how, how well it's going to go in the regular season for him. Lots of time left, Kyle. Oh, come on. Come on. Lots of time left. Don't listen to Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> Pierre's shitting on them. Good. This is purely next. This team looks – okay, here. I will just get this out of the way right now because I want to talk about this. The Leafs game was awful. They're about eight points out of a playoff spot. LA? If you're 10 or out, according to Pierre Gibbing, you will not make the playoff. And so to me, they've got a three-game road trip here. They got Chicago, Nashville, St. Louis. You're not beating Nashville. St. Louis is going to be super desperate. You need to win against Chicago tomorrow night. This team just lost eight in a row. I know they beat St. Louis the other night, but it's a team on the ropes with a new coach, with a very suspect defense. This is a must-win game. If the Kings lose against the Blackhawks tomorrow, I'm saying this on the record, the season is over. It's over. Wow. Now, you you brought up a really interesting point there, Nick, and I want to highlight this for all the L.A. fans who are struggling to get through the days. L.A. needs to acquire the Hamburglar to save <laughs> the season. Is this not the perfect narrative 
Your one and two goalies get injured. Step up, Mr. Hamburglar. Come on, this is what he was born for, is to save teams who we thought were sunk. This is the guy you need. He's buried in the AHL right now, Nick. What are you doing? Why do you have Peter Budai playing games right now when the Hamburglar is buried in the AHL just waiting to save your team? you got to make a call. Well, well, make a call. Hey, there's merit to that. <laughs> but what I will say is that Quickie apparently is coming back next week or something because apparently he's going to skate this week, and, and they're almost rushing him back by the sounds of it. Wow, so you could have him back as soon as next week. Don't rush. And, and I don't think the Hamburglar is going to be stealing any starts from Johnny Quick. And oh, then no. in terms of who they're running with right now, that Cal Peterson kid looked fantastic against the Leafs. Come on. He made, he was making was some score? solid saves. And and based on what I heard about his career in Notre Dame, this guy was a stud. Yeah, everyone's a stud so in LA. I, I think I think they have faith in this kid. And if he's got to carry the load for just one week, so be it. Okay. Well, we'll see. Nick, how many goals did he let in on against the Leafs? One. What? Oh, he, through, he came yeah, in as a back? Half the game, okay, he gotcha. He came in halfway through the second. He oh, let wow. one goal in. Wow. Okay. I thought he started And it was the on game. the power play. Wow. Okay. Cal he was great. That's the only reason I kept watching that game. Because once it was 2-1 Leafs, you knew who was going to win that game. Yeah. But that that kid and he looked kid, great. Well, we'll see what happens. And get this, get get this, a bunch of character. He was the captain oh at Notre God. Dame. They named him the captain. A goalie, which for a goalie is very rare. What? Yeah. What is so? Not you? only is he great, but he's got character. <laughs> you know, onto the ceiling. Oh, wow. Very high character. What is with you loving the character of these L.A. goalies? You always Man, have to... I, I just I saw him play, and I was like, between Jack Campbell and this Cal Peterson kid, the future looks great once Johnny Quick hangs up the skates. So do you go to, whenever you see a new L.A. goalie play, do you go to Google and type in uh, Cal Peterson character moves? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I just heard from the L.A. commentators that okay. they spoke pretty highly of him. Yeah, well, that's pretty cool. A, a captain of a NCAA yeah. team. It ne- I, I don't know. It probably never happened. The fighting so. Irish. That's pretty impressive. But, uh, yeah, you want to you wanna move on to our next segment there, Nick? Sure. I, I think speaking of goalies, it'll be pretty fitting. Right? Yes. I wanted to, just based on how we're doing so far, I want to give a quick word on Vasi, the v- Vasilevsky injury. Not too, too long, just a quick go, and then we'll get into our next segment. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's going to be interesting. Because on one end here, I see Tampa and this fantastic team who doesn't necessarily need a great goalie. You know, that that's what I think. But at the same time, I see Louis Domingue, who's never been a starter I mean, when he did have a glimpse of being a full-time starter, it was in Arizona, and, and it didn't go all too well. No. So, I mean, they had no goal support then. Now he's on with goal support, so we'll see. But, I mean, to me, it, it's this fascinating scenario where you have this fantastic team and this mediocre goalie coming in. So, I, I, I honestly don't know what to make of it. They go very well, and they're going to do great. Or it's going to go terribly, and they're going to have to make it a move for for a goalie externally outside of their organ. Because that AHL goalie they have is going to back him up. He's not nothing to ride home about either. Right. So we'll see here. Yeah. Uh, do you know how long Vasty's out? Was it six to eight weeks? It it is not conclusive yet. Oh. But like it hasn't been stated by the organization. But based on what fractured foots usually lead to, mm. you're looking at about six to eight weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in my opinion, here's what we're going to find out from this injury. We're going to find out who is Louis Demang and how important is Andre Vasilevsky to this team? Because mm. I don't think we, we're not questioning how Tampa Bay can play in front of him, but Louis Domingue, I think it's potential that he could implode under this role. He has not been good this year so far 
from the games he has played. And uh, again, he's never done it. There's no one to help him if he, if he stumbles. So yeah, this is going to be a wait and see. And then uh, it, it might force uh, the hand of, of the Lightning to, to acquire another guy, maybe a Hamburglar. <laughs> so <laughs> well, well, it's going to be cool, man. Like this could really open up a chance for the Leafs to grab top spot in the Atlantic. For sure. Even even down the road. If if Tampa starts to become an average team with this guy, then it, it really opens up a chance, especially when you have Matthews coming back and the Nylander situation coming to a head. So, yeah, this is this is interesting for sure, and I'll be tuning into some lightning games. But uh, Yeah, no, and, and one last thing I'll say is, like, this is not a team with, like, what a lot of people would consider historically as a stout defense. Like, this is not Peter Budai coming in two years ago for the LA Kings, where they adjusted their game plan to make his time very easy, and he ends up putting up all-star worthy numbers, this washed-up goalie for this LA Kings team. This Tampa team, they, they, they score a lot, but they give up a lot of scoring chances. That That's kind of been their MO, right? Yeah. So, we'll see if he can cover up these blemishes. And we'll see if John Cooper maybe puts in place a more defensively stout system to make Louis's job easier. Yeah, I was gonna say the their play hasn't been like that in in recent memory of you know the defensively stout game, but they do have the talent both at forward sure. and at D to adjust to this. And I think Cooper's mm-hmm. got the wherewithal to uh, to put a, a better system in place to protect Demang a little bit more. So what we might see is their goals go down a little bit. And then their their chances against go down as well. So, yeah, this will be a test for Cooper as well. That that's another thing we we should mention is that um, we're we're gonna see what kind of coaching medal this guy has. And I I've gone on the record to say I don't like the guy, but I think he's a really good coach. So, we'll uh, we'll see what happens. But Tampa Bay is a cool case right now. Okay, Nick, we're moving on to our next segment here. Um, we're going over to player surprises. Now, a couple weeks ago. We had uh, teams that surprised us and, you know, both good and bad and whether they, we thought they were sustainable. Uh, now we're going to get into players. So we're going to name about, uh, we're going to name a couple players each, both on the cold and hot starts they've had and whether this is for real or this is not. So I'm going to give it a go first, if you don't mind. And we're going to start with players who have had a bad start to the season. Are you ready? Nice. Go so ahead. The, the first one I want to say... Maybe the most obvious one, I think it is in my opinion, Carey Price. Mm. So here we have a 307 goals against. We have an 892 save percentage. We have five wins and all this in 12 games played. Uh, So Carey Price, he hasn't been very good since the end of the 2017 season. Um, He's been a far cry from what people said was the best goalie in the NHL, probably the best goalie in the world. Uh, last year was really messed up for Montreal in general. And I think this is where things started off. I think Montreal just got off to such a poor start and Price got that injury and uh, just things derailed early for them. And I think coming back from that injury into that just hostile Montreal market, he hasn't been able to find his game. He hasn't been able to find his rhythm. And uh, he made the he had a really like really heartfelt interview actually um, after his last game that he played and he played pretty terribly it was against Buffalo and he said listen guys there's nothing wrong with my body it's all upstairs and I I really felt what he was saying because he was just being brutally honest he was saying listen it's a mental thing and I just have to find my rhythm back so uh, I think. It's all about his confidence right now. And I think if he can get some solid wins together, I think he can regain his form once again. I don't think he's totally lost his skills. I don't think he's lost his his mental abilities uh, from from being injured. I think this is it's just a matter of time before Carey Price becomes a great goalie in the NHL again. Maybe not the best goalie. Maybe those years are behind him. But I think Price will... Uh, will come back to form and I, I truly can't wait for Montreal to uh to get this guy back into into playing like he can I I really think it's going to happen and uh I wish I wish the guy all the best because man p- 
struggling in a Montreal market, that's not a that's not an easy task, Nick. So let's uh let's 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 hear for Carey Price. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree. He, he, Anti Niemi has stolen some starts of late. We talked about it from the from the top of the show, and and hopefully he he finds his way again. But what I will say is that I don't think he's totally to blame. I I think that Montreal defense has really let him out to dry on many nights. I I mean a David Schlemko is playing top defensive line minutes. That that just can't happen. Yes. Yeah, and I think he so, I, I think yeah. he can't wait to get Shea Weber back even though Shea Weber's not the fleetest of foot. It's just Shea Weber's positioning and and his able to his ability to clear the front of the net and stop those cross seam passes. It's going to mean a lot to this team. It's going to mean a lot to carry. It's going to be a little bit of a peace of mind for the guy. So when he comes back, I think things will settle down a little bit. But, uh, yeah, I think it's just a matter of time. And, and you did mention that the team's kind of breaking down in front of him quite often. But he, in the past, has been the guy to, to erase those mistakes. I mean, this is not a whole lot of new stuff from him because he's been covering up Montreal mistakes for a long time now. I've seen him in uh, in in playoff series where he had to stand on his head, but they were still winning games. So there's a there's a Carey Price in in this guy who's uh, who's just ready to to pop out and and start stealing games. But when we see that, I'm not sure. It's it's a tough call. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. We'll we'll see. Especially so, when Weber comes back. So yeah, yeah. My, who's your second player? My next player, this one's going to be a hell of a lot shorter because I don't have a whole lot to say about him. I'm just pissed in general. It's uh, Max Pacioretty of the Vegas Golden Knights. Two goals, two assists, four points in 15 games. Talk about a slow start. Actually, you know what? I'm going to change that. I think Pacioretty's just slow and bad in the first place. I think Pacioretty excelled in the past, in an, in an NHL that is a lot different from today. I've, I don't think Pacioretty has ever been a great skater. I don't think he's ever had great hands. I don't think he's ever been all that great on the boards. Uh, even his shot doesn't jump out at you. It's not a sniper shot. It's more of a dirty garbage kind of kind of goals that he gets. Uh, so, honestly, I, I think Pacioretty, just things have caught up with him. I don't think he can, uh, he can be that 30-goal guy anymore. Even on a on a team like Vegas, I just uh, I I don't have a lot of faith in the guy. That that's that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, I I don't even want to talk because I I own him just as well just as much as you do. I had him and I had to drop him. Yeah, because he just was not cutting, and uh, I I was none too pleased. And, yeah, and I see him finding his game until his dance partner Paul Stasny comes back. So we'll we'll see, but I have my doubts. And there's all they also just put him back on the they put him on the top line, which is like and honestly right. if and again with my luck, as soon as I dropped him, the news broke. He's on the top line, right? And then Braden picked him up, right? And then, crazy. It's, it's not like I'm all that upset because it's it's a guy I was fully ready to get rid of and to to part ways with, but it's just like come on, man. Put him on the top line a little earlier than that, you stupid mm-hmm. fox. Anyways, my next one's uh, it's kind of an interesting case. And you wouldn't necessarily call it a bad start, but it's just for his standards it might be a bad start. It's Eric Carlson over in uh, San Jose. Uh, he's got zero goals, eight assists, eight points in 19 games. Uh, it's a career low points per game wise so far since his rookie year. Um I don't have a lot to say on this player except for the fact that all the advanced stats say this; these numbers are going to go up. Uh, I'm not really worried about him, per se, uh, in terms of turning it on. But I will say that Brent Burns is still... Well, I mean, Brent Burns is over a point per game right now. I, I don't... I ha- like, I, I haven't been watching the San Jose games. I don't exactly know what's going on. But uh, I'm sure Carlson hasn't been that bad. It's just... I don't know. It's... Can he put up the, his usual numbers on this San Jose team like I thought he could? Or, or is this kind of what you were worried about where they're, they're struggling to give him that same 1A kind of time? Yeah, I, I don't know. Everything coming from San Jose is saying 
don't read into the numbers. He's been invaluable to this team on both ends of the ice. But that could just be bias and defending the guy. Yeah. And hoping yeah. he resigns long term. Whereas when we look at the numbers as, you know, objective, you know, an, an analyst of this player, we look at the numbers and they're just uncharacteristic of him. And I have think a lot of that has to do with Brett Burns taking the front seat here, riding shotgun. And he is eating up all these top PP minutes. And you see that with his numbers. Brett Burns is the top fantasy defenseman. Mm, yeah. And there, there's no room two top fantasy defensemen on one NHL team. And because of that, Carlson, he's taken a back seat. And I haven't watched too many of their, too many of their games, I'll be honest. I'll, I'll be watching closely that Leafs game today. And yeah. uh, I, I hope to see what exact what exact role yeah. they put him in. Because yeah. I know he, he played a lot with Vlasic at the start of the year <laughs> in, in more of a defensive role. And then they broke that up. So... I don't know. I'm I'm interested to see what Peter DeBoer's been doing. Yeah. So I'll just mention a quick honorable three honorable mentions, just really quickly. Not going to analyze or anything. Uh, I'll start with Victor Hedman, who's got five points in eleven games. Uh, Ryan Strom, who's been awful with two points in eighteen games, and uh, Aaron Ekblad, who we talked about earlier, who's got three points in fifteen games. Those are just quick mm-hmm. honorable cold start mentions. All right, well, I'll go with my three here, and I'll, I'll be pretty brief about them. Yeah. My first is a goaltender. Hmm. Tuka Rask. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm basing a lot of this on not so much injuries, because I think it's kind of cheating to say this player's struggling because he's been injured. Yeah. I mean, you can't do much about injuries. Yeah. But this guy, he hasn't been injured. He had a personal matter he had to attend to yeah. recently. But when he has played, he, he has not been great. Eight starts, four wins, four losses, 305 GAA, 901 save percentage. For an elite defensive team, those numbers aren't aren't great at all. And many would argue he's lost his job to Yarrow Halak, which I was very worried about going into the year because Yarrow Halak has always been a stud. He's just played on some bad teams of late. Uh, especially the Islanders the last couple of years. Yeah. So now that he's actually playing for a playoff NHL team, he's back to where he looked earlier in his career when he played for, you know, St. Louis or Montreal. Mm-hmm. And and he's kind of, he's internally, there's this internal competition there in that organization, which is what Don Sweeney, their GM, wanted. They wanted to push Tuca. They didn't want Tuca to be content and just say, you know, oh, I'm, I'm the starter no matter what. And now he's kind of lost that job. It's a 50-50 timeshare. And if I'm a Rask owner, and I took this guy oh. in the fifth round of my draft, I'm furious. You're sad as shit. He's, he, oh, yeah. Because he's, he's only starting half their games. And when he does start, he's a pile of shit. <laughs> and, and you look at his Yahoo ranking, 334. Ooh. I mean, that, that's just bad. For the fifth round, it's inexcusable. Yeah. So I'm furious about that. My next player, Anze Kopitar. Oh, yeah. yeah. This was a guy who was a Hart Trophy, you know, he was in the discussion last year. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Put up 90-plus points. That's and insane. now, Kyle, a miserable six points in oh. 16 games. Oh, That's just god-awful. It's god-awful. He's not even covering shots. He's got 36 shots, two power play points. For a guy who was... <sighs> third line or sorry third round maybe late second round pick this is awful yeah and uh right now he's ranked 271 in yahoo in our league and uh you got to be furious about this you're yeah. hoping he can get it back together i've always been a Copa fan but then again it is the la kings and it looks like a team that's just cursed so maybe you want to stay away so I, I can't really condone investing too much in this guy. So we'll see. But needless to say, he's been one of the biggest disappointments this year. Yeah. And uh, my third pick, and this one hits close to home, Nikola Ehlers. Oh. 
Okay. This was a guy taken ADP around 56. Fifth round. Taken yeah. around the March or so range of the draft, which is just bonkers to think about right now. <laughs> yeah. And and right now he's ranked 349 in our league in Yahoo. Oh, my God. Eight points in 17 games. Just four goals, four assists. One power play point. 37 shots on goal. Just not where he needs to be for that range in the draft. I have no idea why he was going that high. I felt like it almost tricked me. I saw him there in the draft, and I was like, oh, this guy's probably good. He's he's put up 60 points consistently the last few years. And and I've just, boy, oh, boy, did I, did I, I did awful there. So I, I'm just not a fan. I mean, you see where he is in this in the depth chart. He's not going to be on that top DP unless there's a major injury. He's not about to just jump ahead of a Kyle Connor or a Patrick Laine or a Blake Wheeler. He He's a good player. He just happens to be on a very good team where he's plummeted in the depth chart. Mm. And so he's kind of in a tough spot. I know he's playing with the two big guns in Wheeler and Fifely right now, which thank God, because otherwise... This guy would be borderline droppable. Oh, that's harsh. But uh, yeah, I, I'm very disappointed. This was my one mistake in the draft, and and I'm kicking myself over it. So I, I can only I, I can only assume other Ealers owners are saying the same thing. And it, it's just been really disappointing to this point. Hopefully he picks it up. But to me, I mean, how the, the ceiling can only be so high when he's not on the first PP on that deadly first. Yeah. So if if you're just getting even strength points, you're sealing 60 points. And if you're sealing 60 points, you shouldn't be going in the fifth round. No. So I, I just don't, I don't see why this guy was there. And uh, I don't see his season really turning around, to be honest. I'll, uh, I'll give you Brendan Gallagher. Yeah, I saw that deal you sent me. No fucking way. Why would you not at least think about that? Because one guy has a ceiling. Ehlers has a good ceiling. Whereas Gallagher, he could be great like last year, or he could be meh. And to me, it seems like that Domi, that Domi Druan line is, is, is the line to own if you're in a fantasy league. And, and that Gallagher unit, not so much. Top power so I, I'm kind of staying away. Yeah, but he's not, you know, he's not sexy. He doesn't really play on the circle. He's kind of a net front guy. Yeah. I, I'm just, I'm not a fan of those players. All right, all right. Well, let's get on. Do you want to go over to the hot players now? Hot players? Sure, let's do that. Okay, well, you just mentioned him. My first one is Max Domi. Of course it is. How could it not be? Uh, you know, when we do this one, Nick, I guess I'll just say my three like you did, and then we'll talk after, I guess. And I'll make sure. it a bit quicker. So, yeah, Max Domi, who the hell saw this coming? They traded uh, Alex Galchenyuk to the Arizona Coyotes. And there was a lot of naysayers out there. I think you and me had a phone call right after it happened. And, and we were both pretty excited for Montreal. Because um, Max Domi has the, the pedigree. Uh, it's just that he's been kind of, you know, kind of not finding his way in Arizona. But my goodness. He's already got more goals than he had last year and the year before that. It's crazy. Uh, it's a huge resurgence for the guy. He's always had the talent. We saw him in the juniors. That was the year we, we were in first year, and we were watching it in uh, in your res room there. And uh, my God, he was fantastic. So I think he just needed this this big open market where his personality really thrives. And uh, wouldn't you know it, Marc Bergevin trades off Galchenyuk and he finds a number one center maybe he's not supposed to be a number one center but he finds a guy who's playing this number one center role and he's playing it really really well I think he's like top 10 in league scoring now with 22 points in 18 games um, so yeah Max Domi has found some chemistry with Jonathan Drouin but even when he's not making plays with Drouin he's He's passing the eye test. He's he's making plays. He's shooting the puck. He's he looks great out there, and uh, I I saw it in preseason. The guy looks fast. He's so fast out there. Is he's the whole package right now? He's he's got some grit. He's got a shot. He's got a he's got vision. He's got speed. Hands. 
I don't see why this can't continue. The thing is, I'm not going to say it's going to continue like it is right now. I could definitely see Domi finishing within and around 70 points around there. I think that's a very safe bet for him. But this is a slam dunk for Mark Bergevin. I think he, uh, I don't know if he expected this, but man, this is exactly what Montreal needed. Uh, number two, Thomas Shabbat. 22 points in 18 games. This, these are Domi's exact numbers. Now he's got five goals and 17 assists. Uh, Thomas Shabbat is another one of those world junior heroes for Canada. This guy was absolutely dynamite on the blue line for Canada not too long ago, just a couple of years ago. Uh, a guy me and Nick were very, very excited about when he was just breaking out into the NHL. Uh, and now Eric Carlson's finally gone. He's finally got the reins to be that uh, number one offensive guy for Ottawa. Uh, and he's been excellent, and the talent is there. Uh, now, but this one, there's a really good reason why his numbers are going to drop. Uh, according to the numbers, he's relying very, very heavily on secondary assists production. I think he leads the NHL in secondary assists. Now, what that means is... He's in on the play, you know, he's he's on the ice, but uh, a lot of those secondary assists can be counted as lucky in a way. So in terms of that, I think the, the point production will fall off a little bit, but he's still an excellent, uh, excellent option on the blue line. I'm not going to take that away from him. I think he's uh, a guarantee to get over 45 points. And so saying that as a defenseman, that's, that's amazing. I mean, all he needs is another you know, 23 points and he's got, uh, he's got 45. So yeah, he's, uh, he's going to finish with excellent numbers, but definitely not what he's doing right now. Uh, number three, Miko Rantanen of the Colorado Avalanche plays on the best line in hockey. He's been stupid good this season, stupid good, seven goals, 22 assists in 29 points, uh, 29 points in 18 games. I, I, I may add, uh, we talked about Max Domi and Thomas Shabbat being very impressive with 22 points. This guy's got 22 assists alone. He's got insane production with Nathan McKinnon and Gabriel Landeskog. Um, and honestly, the scary thing is the talent is absolutely there. The line mates are absolutely there. The ice time is absolutely there. Uh, this, his scoring will come down a little bit. He's not going to put up 130 points like he's projected right now. But, uh, man, there's no reason why a guy this talented can't put up over 90 points this year. I saw him, uh, whenever I watch Colorado games, don't get me wrong, Nathan McKinnon jumps right off the, the screen to me, but Miko Rantanen is very quietly very skilled. I don't think Nathan McKinnon is this you know, 90-plus point guy if Miko Rantanen isn't driving a lot of this play as well. So... I, I've been very, very impressed with him. He's very subtle with his stick. He he can jump in on a rush and just make deft passes to make like last night, McKinnon's goal. It was it was a really good play. Rantanen's got a big body, he's got a big shot, and he's got vision out the wazoo. So this is a player I really like to get over ninety points this year. So he can continue, just not at a hundred and thirty point pace. Uh just quickly honorable mentions. Skinner is a scoring machine right now. I, I learned that last week when Braden ripped me up. Um, Elias Pettersson, who we talked about last week, so we don't, we don't need to say much more about that. Um, and then Sebastian Ajo has been very surprisingly good too. And I think uh, he's really driving the offense over in Carolina. He just needs a little bit more help, and I think he could uh, he could be a really big-time player in the league. All right, once again, I'll be pretty brief here about my three. Yeah. I will start with Jeffrey Skinner. Yeah. 20 points in 18 games. That includes 13 goals, 7 assists. He's pitching on the on that deadly Sabres power play with 5 power play points. And in typical Skinner fashion, he's covering shots with 60 shots so far. Oof. Albeit the shooting percentage is pretty high, 21.7%. It's, it's bound to regress. But regardless, he's been fantastic. And, he, and he's got a spot on that top line with, with uh, Jackie Eichel. Oh, that's a good player. So, to me, this guy's been one of the steals of the draft. He either went late in the draft 
or you know in some leagues maybe even a waiver wire guy. So if if you're lucky to have Skinner right now, you're you're dancing. Mm-hmm. Player number two, Michael Furland. This is more a guy who he's more holistic, covers a bunch of things. He's got 13 points in 18 games, nine goals, four assists, 61 shots, which you may not expect for more of a net front guy, gritty guy like him. And then the hits, 55 hits. He's among the the hit leaders in the NHL. So he is a full category coverer in standard Yahoo leagues. Hell, even on the power play, he's got five power play points, somehow being a presence on that Carolina unit. He's on the top line with Aho, who you just mentioned. This guy is surprising me. And I did not know much about him. I still don't know much about him because I don't watch a lot of Carolina plays or games. And he's been great. And and if you read Dober Hockey, he, he's been ra- ranting about him as well. So th- this, this, this was an astute pickup for me. I, I didn't know what I was getting into, but he's been great so far. How sustainable it is, we'll see. But uh, he, he's been a stud so far. And number three, a guy that I'm kicking myself over, just like Nikolai Ehlers. Oh. Timo Meyer. Oh. 18 points and 19. 12 goals among the lead leaders. Wow. Six assists. And yet only two power play points, which shows that a lot of this production is coming at even strength, which is just nuts. Yeah, that's good. Which shows the ceiling could be so much higher if he were to get a role on that first San Jose unit. Again, 66 shots. That's fantastic for a guy like him. I took him late in my draft. I think he was my last pick. And, and I dropped the guy. I dropped him at the end of the first week or start of the second week. It, it was to make like a, a short-term pickup. And boys and girls, here's some advice. Never do that. Do, do not sacrifice a guy who can have potential sustained success for just a week so you could pick up one or two more wins in a certain category. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm kicking myself over it. He looks great. You watch San Jose game. Kyle, I implore you to keep an eye out for him tonight when he plays the Leafs. Yeah. Um, he, this guy's been, he's got great chemistry with Coach Her. Great chemistry with Hurdle. And and we'll see. Maybe Peter DeBoer gives him more power play time. In which case, this guy's going to be great. But the way it's looking right now, this guy should get 30 goals. And and that doesn't happen. You don't, you don't find that on the waiver wire pretty often. So he's been found money. And uh, certainly he's been good enough to be one of the surprise players so far. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Good, definitely good picks. I like uh, I like how you pointed out some guys that I would not have initially thought of there, which is uh, hmm. which is solid. Nice. All right. Well, uh, I I think because we're done with that, I'm gonna turn over the show. You're gonna step on the stage here, and we're gonna have our first uh, edition of the Kyle Nice Prospect Report. For those of you who don't know, Kyle is a very astute scout when it comes to amateur hockey. He loves to cover OHL, WHL, American League, European Leagues. He's very much into amateur talent. Myself, not so much. I only really watch the World Juniors, but Kyle's been very plugged in here. So, Kyle, I'm going to turn the mic over to you, and you're going to brief our listeners on some of the top prospects that have caught your eye so far. Wow, Nick. What an intro for this segment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the reason why I was inspired to do this for today is because, as some of you may know, that the CHL versus Russia series is on right now. So if you don't know what that is, it's basically the Russia puts together a team of their own and they face two games in WHL, two games in OHL, and two games in the Q. So this kind of prompted me to say, hey, we, why not check in on some guys and uh, for the most part, we're going to be looking at 2019 draft eligibles for this little segment here, uh, with the addition of one guy in particular, uh, Alexi Lafreniere, who's a 2020 draft eligible guy. And I just have to get this out there because of all the highly, highly touted guys, I've never seen someone who just confuses me this much. 
Uh, so Lafreniere, he as a guy with all the pedigree in the world, he's got he le- he led the queue. He leads the queue in points per game right now, and he just turned 17 in October. Now last year, as a 16 year old, he had 40 goals. The first one to do it in the queue since Sidney Crosby. So the pedigree is crazy. He was amazing in the Ivan Ivan Halinka. But what I notice about this player and why I can't fully, fully commit to saying he's going to be amazing in the NHL is because he just doesn't have skills that jump out at you. Like Jack Hughes, who we're going to talk about in a sec, is a fantastic skater, amazing hands, great vision. He's dynamic in every way. We've seen McDavid, who's obviously dynamic. We've seen Matthews has got one of the best shots. Like these first overall picks, they often have one particular characteristic that you can obviously see right away. Now, Lafreniere, he's not a great skater, which is crazy for a guy with this pedigree, especially in in, uh, the modern NHL. Um, It's hard to imagine a superstar young player who isn't a fantastic skater now. Uh, he's not particularly fast nor very well balanced. Just technically, his skating is not amazing. Now, he's an average skater in most aspects, uh, aside from his lateral movements, which are very strong. Like I said, he doesn't have a, a big booming shot that'll jump out at you. His hands are are really really good, but they're not gonna you know they're not as quick as you might think. They're not like McDavid quickness or Mc, or McKinnon quickness even. Uh, what stands out the most and why this guy is so hard to peg is his brain. His hockey IQ is off the charts. So what I notice here is sometimes it's hard to see that how good he really is. And sometimes when he's off mentally, he can just look really bad. That's what's crazy, man. Like I was watching the, the Q versus Russia and it, he didn't look good. So if he's off mentally, he's not doing a whole lot for you. Now, I don't know how this is going to translate into the NHL, but uh, I really can't wait to see him at the World Juniors. I do think he'll make that team. And as a 17-year-old to make Canada's World Junior team, it's really rare. So if he can do that, that'll be a really big bonus for him. But uh, I, I got to see more of this guy. I'm not r- quite ready to po- appoint him as, oh, definitely going number one in 2020, like some people are. Like I said, all the numbers are there, but it's it's a very interesting case for in terms of prospects. Now let's get over to the 2019 draft eligibles, and we'll start right at the top. A quick word on Jack Hughes for those who don't exactly know who this guy is. And uh, my goodness, I, I don't like admitting it all the time, but he is unbelievably dynamic. He's putting He's putting up a dumb 36 points in 18 games. Uh, for the U.S. National Under-18 team. He's just crushed the Five Nations Tournament, averaging about a five points per game. Um, what I will say is he's a small player. He's five foot 10, 168 pounds. So definitely not out of place in today's NHL. It just It's a factor you have to consider. Uh, now, how does he make up for a lack of size? Well, he's got extremely dynamic skills he's got stick skills that will remind you of Matthews he's got wonderful speed for his size his skating laterally is uh, is amongst the best in the, in the last five years that we've seen uh, he can he also has a rocket of a shot and his vision's fantastic what I like to compare him to is a Johnny Gaudreau but more dynamic in every way shifty uh, great shot just really really good player um, based on what scouts are saying in terms of comparables, they say he's just a tier below Matthews, just a little bit, and slightly above Jack Eichel. So that's uh, that's the kind of level this guy can p- potentially bring a team come uh, come next year. So really, really exciting. Uh, as long as that size isn't a problem, which I don't see it being a problem, then he's going to be one of those guys we talk about in that uh, in that vein. McDavid, Matthews, Jack Hughes, like these guys are going to be the future of the NHL. Uh, now the consensus number two, Capo Caco, uh, playing over in the Finnish league. Now this guy is no slouch. A lot of people say that if Jack Hughes weren't in this draft, he would go number one overall in a lot of drafts. Uh, he's really good. He's the whole package. He's got size. He's got scoring. He's got vision. 
Uh, he's putting up really, really amazing numbers in the Finnish league for his age. Um, we've seen some amazing Finnish talent come in the last few years in Line A, Ranton, and, and Barkov. You can add Capo Caco to that list. He's going to be amo- like amongst the caliber of player as Line A, Ranton, and, and Barkov. So, yeah, the, the Finns, they just keep out keep on pumping out amazing talent, and this is the next guy. We saw Kotkin the Emmy last year, and uh, Capo Caco is the next one, but he's more of a dynamic talent. So really excited for him, and, and he's a winger too, I should mention. Jack Hughes is the center. This guy's a right wing, left wing kind of player. Uh, two more guys I just want to quickly highlight. We know this is a strong year for the WHL uh, in terms of draft eligibles. There's a lot of WHL guys in the top 10 even. So first one I want to say is Kirby Doc. This guy is a favorite of mine for this draft. He's, in my opinion, the top Canadian in the draft. Uh, he's a big, rangy forward. He, is in, he has excellent passing abilities. Nick, you can compare this guy, Kirby Doc, to a Ryan Getzloff. He's got fantastic vision, and he's a pass-first guy. He's actually got a great shot, surprisingly, but he doesn't use it enough. Much like Ryan Getzlaff, he's he has a threat to shoot, but he just doesn't use it enough. He's an above-average skater, could be better. He's got good top-line speed, but it's just uh, the lateral lateral movements could use some work. He was really good at the Ivan Holinka Gretzky tournament, and uh, man, this guy could be a cornerstone center. Man, he's six foot four, and he can do a lot of good things. He doesn't have a certain weakness either. He doesn't. Uh, nothing jumps out at you that says, "Oh, this guy needs to work on that." It's just this guy is solid. He's a Ryan Getzlaff. Uh, next guy, Dylan Cousins, the whole package, a large, powerful centerman again. And th- this is the thing with these two WHL guys, Doc and Cousins. They're both six three, six four centermen, righties. Like teams want these kinds of guys so badly, and Cousins especially because he's a two way guy. He's a great skater. He's got a great shot. He's got great vision. He's smart. He's not afraid to be physical. And the best thing is he's fucking born in the Yukon. So that's a bonus wow. right there. So this is that Yukon guy that you'll be hearing a lot about in the coming days. Um, he's actually rumored to have a chance at making the World Junior Team for Canada. It's a very long shot, but he's he's got that chance because of that big physical body. Uh, so... Both Doc and Cousins are both big, but Cousins is more the guy to use that body. Doc isn't very physical. Cousins is a guy who definitely will rough it up with uh, with his opponents. Um, he's really great at everything, but not excellent at one particular thing. Um, again, he's a guy that every NHL team will covet. Think of this guy as a larger Patrice Bergeron. Um, maybe not, but just not with that kind of level of mature hockey sense in terms of a defensive perspective. Now, why I say that is because he's a two-way guy. He can be a very effective number one center. And think of him as a 80-point potential kind of guy, but a guy you can just wow. play in all zones. This guy, is, he's a great two-way guy. And uh, if he matures the right way and if his brain really catches up to what the NHL speed will be like, he'll be like a Bergeron, Kopitar kind of guy, just a very solid guy that you can really trust. So like I said, this guy, people are going to covet him. He might go three overall. I I like doc a little bit more because I think he's, he's got more dynamic, um, like game changing abilities skill wise, but, uh, cousins like, man, people are going to want this guy and it's going to be hard to take Capo Caco over cousins because he's such a useful centerman. I mean the, the whole center bias thing, it's gonna be it's gonna come right down to the wire, but Capo Caco is is the more dynamic of the two. So that's just a quick uh, quick word on the 2019 draft eligibles plus Alexi Lafreniere. Now uh, the last Q Q versus Russia game is actually on right now, so we'll see uh, we'll see if Lafreniere does a little bit better in in this game. He struggled in game one, so yeah, it's gonna be exciting, and this is uh, this is gonna be a race that we're all gonna watch closely because. Man, this is a deep draft. The The top-end talent is really good, and uh, the top 10 is fantastic. If you're coming bottom 10 in the league this year, it's not all that bad, trust me, because there's more guys after these guys that I mentioned that are that are really good. 
So yeah, that's our little draft special there. And uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it for the rest of the year as well. Yeah, no, I, I'm super, super impressed. I mean, I, I already knew about those two first guys you mentioned. Everyone's been talking about them. Mm. But between those last three there, comparisons to Barkov, Getzlav, Bergeron, Kopitar, yeah. I, I'm excited. And, and the fact that at the very least, you see them having a good chance of making the World Junior lineup for their respective teams. I think a lot of people are going to get to see these players play on a big stage. Yeah. So that excites me. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm fired up. Yeah, so Kako and Hughes will 100% make their teams. Um, just just that's because that's how things will work for them. Hughes is, is, again, a 19 eligible, and he's just that good. Lafreniere, it's going to be a long shot because of his, his youth. And for Canada, Canada's just really deep, so it's really hard for 17-year-olds to make it. So that's that's where Cousins might fall short. So yeah, we'll, we'll we'll look at it, and I can't wait if we see a Lafreniere Hughes matchup in in the World Juniors. You can tell. Uh, I'll tell you right now. I'll, I'll be glued to my seat with a couple beers in me for sure. That'll be a fantastic <laughs> matchup because there there's all kinds of talk out there. Oh, who who would you rather have, Hughes or Lafreniere? If if Lafreniere was in this draft, who would you take? Yeah, there, it's out there, Nick. And right now, it's squarely Hughes. Hughes is the better player right now, but. Again, Lafreniere is a, a weird case. It's it's going to be cool. Nice. Well, if that's all you have to add about that, with uh, without further ado, we will do our closing here. Thank you again for tuning in to the Rink Moose Hockey Podcast. This is episode 16. Next week, just a little preview, we'll be going over our surprise and disappointing teams. Like I said earlier, U.S. Thanksgiving is right around the corner. It's usually that benchmark moment where you can evaluate a team, see what they are, see if they're for real. And uh, we're going to have some fun talking about what we see happening for the next three quarters of the season. So, uh, yeah, thank you for tuning in. And until then, it's been a pleasure to serve you guys. And uh, Rink Moose... Signing off.